welcome everyone to today's Rancher online meetup. I am Shannon Williams, and uh, we will be talking today about Rio, a new project here at Rancher um, that we introduced last month that uh, we are calling a MicroPaz. And uh, looking forward, thank you so much everyone for, for coming. It looks like we have a, a ton of attendees and a ton of registrants for today's it, it, today's meetup more more than ever before um, so hopefully we will have uh, an excellent showing of content to uh, to deliver to all of you who have taken the time to come out today and learn about your project um, real quickly just uh, for those of you who don't know me I'm Shannon Williams I'm one of the founders here in Rancher Labs I am uh, on Twitter at SW355 you can um, you can also find me on LinkedIn or Shannon or anything else you want to find are you sharing your screen Oh, did I forget to have the screen share? No. Yeah. There you go. All right. There we go. Um, thanks, Darren. The uh, uh, so that's me, and uh, I'm joined today by the voice you just heard, Darren. Darren Shepard, my co-founder and uh, chief architect here at Rancher. Darren, you've already said hello, but maybe you can yep. say hi again. Hey, everyone. We should have a a really fun a fun day today. I think we're going to be going through a lot of cool stuff. Um, for those of you who've never attended one of our online meetups before, they are um, they really are a lot of fun. We do them in a in a pretty different way than your typical uh, webinar, and that they are meant to be really interactive. We chat a lot, we um, share a lot of demos, we focus on uh, answering your questions, and the uh, the approach we take is is really one where we don't try to wrap these up at any specific time. Um, we will I don't think we've ever gone less than an hour with one of these so we record them if you have to leave don't feel bad um, we won't be offended just uh, you know after the event ends we'll send out an email with the recording uh, with links to the slides and you can always kind of follow along or if you want to ask questions later feel free to hit us up on uh, Twitter or Slack or anywhere else and we'll, we'll do our best to answer your questions um, your questions are really why we're here so we're going to talk but this is a two-directional thing it's one of the reasons we have so many people who come is is you really get a you know treat this like we're all sitting in a room and, and doing a real live meetup ask your questions um stay as late as you want we, we don't have anywhere to be we clear our calendar for the afternoon so we can stay here and answer all your questions the other thing is we demo live everything there's no recordings there's no screen demos um this is real stuff really running on machines or in the cloud so if things break uh, we try to have something as a backup but um you know sometimes darren has to go and Pack something up and figure out why it's not working, especially when we're showing you really early alpha and beta code. So, be prepared for uh, you know for for real the real world. With that, I'll just kind of point you to our YouTube channel. If you uh, miss this one or you want to catch any of our old meetups, you want to go learn about K3S or K3OS or Submarin or some of the other cool projects we've been announcing this year, or you want to go and, and dig into any of the information about Rancher and Rancher OS, you can find it all. In the YouTube channel, you can find everything on our um, uh, in our website as well. You can find most of these recordings there. If you can't find them, uh, feel free to Slack us or let us know. the 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 community of of, of you who come to these, um, we really appreciate all your time, your um, your questions. If you haven't already introduced yourself to the community, um, you know one of the just kind of the traditions we have is post a picture of yourself, um, whatever you're doing, wherever you're at. And, uh, and hashtag it with Rancher Meetup, and I'll, I'll go back and stick them up here. We'll introduce you to the community, tell people who you are and what you're doing. We also have a, a Slack channel in the Rancher Slack, so if you want to join that, it's just slack.rancher.io to join the Rancher Slack channel. You can just Google it. Um, and then within there, there's a channel called Online Meetup. So if you want to have a separate conversation that's unmoderated and, and you know you can ask or all you know chat with other people, by all means, jump in the Slack channel. It's uh, it's, it's pretty new. We just we just rolled that out this year. So, lots of ways to connect and talk. Uh, lots of opportunities to get your questions answered, and uh, we'll be we'll be diving in deep today. Our agenda is is pretty straightforward. I'm going to give you just a my typical one or two slide. Who is Rancher and what do we do? Um, I'll then dive into this whole idea of a micropass. What are, what are we doing and why did we build it? What the heck is it? Darren will um, will introduce Rio. He'll be demoing and showing you the product, showing you what you can do with it, um, you know, walking through its functionality. And we'll wrap up with your questions. You know, show you how to download and get started with all this. 
and uh, point you to any other resources that might might help you with along the journey. So with that, I'll just take a, a minute to introduce Rancher. For, for those of you who don't know, our Rancher is an open source software company. We've been around now for about four years. And uh, I think this is probably like our 40th one of these online meetups, 40 or 50th one of these online meetups. We do them most months, not always every month, but most months. And uh, as a software company, what Rancher is most well known for is Rancher itself, our open source container management plat platform. It, it basically is a, uh, a way for you to implement management for Kubernetes regardless of where you run it. And it, it does multi-tenancy, allows you to build multiple clusters in different places and centralize all of your management of those clusters, your policy management, your logging and monitoring. Um, it's, uh, it itself is 100% open source. It does uh, you know, really kind of service the needs for a lot of users of the um, platform capabilities around Kubernetes. So it will deal with all the IT side of that, which means provisioning clusters and upgrading and lifecycle management, dealing with auth across clusters, policy like pod security policies, network isolation, um, you know, capacity management, monitoring at the cluster level. Um, but for users, it, it provides more of the user experience on, around Kubernetes as well. So it implements a lot of technology like uh, Prometheus and um, Helm and, and Grafana and Linkerd and uh, not Linkerd, Fluentd, and um, and just makes you know makes the user experience around Kubernetes really turnkey. And all of that then gets managed. As I said, it's all 100% open source, really easy to use. And we also roll have rolled out lots of other projects. You might be aware of things like K3S, which is a really lightweight Linux distro, Arc KE, which is a, a standard size Kubernetes distro, the um, uh, Submariner project. Uh, Longhorn project and Rio. So um, today, Rio is going to be the one we're talking about. It's a project we're really excited about. It's it's really a a, a new focus for us, and it really stems from what we see as a, a massive growth in the availability and adoption of Kubernetes. You know, Rio is at its core um, built to focus on this uh, this new paradigm we kind of live in now where Kubernetes is everywhere, right? Getting clusters has really never been easier, right? If you're a Rancher user, that we have Rancher itself provisions clusters, you can deploy with RKE or K3S. There's just so many ways to easily deploy and build a Kubernetes cluster. But you know, in the cloud, Kubernetes is available from just about any cloud provider you're familiar with. Um, there's tons of open source installers that can deploy you know, clusters for you. There's lots of implementation of desktop Kubernetes. There's somebody, you know, there really is no shortage of ways to get access to a cluster. And as that's happened, you know, that's it's really opened up a lot of excitement around using Kubernetes and a lot of teams and users, you know, adopting Kubernetes as a platform to build their applications. The um, the other thing it's created is this massive, expanding, ever expanding ecosystem of technology. That is uh, that's used with and around Kubernetes, and um, this is the CNCF's ecosystem slide. They call it, and it, it's a it's a useful slide because it kind of highlights the different functional areas and capabilities that are used with and around Kubernetes to deliver you know cloud native applications, um, and it tries to show all the different competing approaches to some of these areas. But with that, you end up looking at just a, um, a relatively you know, ever increasing and more complex set of technology, all of which adds value, all of which you know, solves specific problems, and, um, you know, but which can be really daunting. And I think as, you know, uh, you know, as users trying to adopt Kubernetes, you know, looking at this, most teams that I work with, most teams that we work with, you know, they, they have architects who are trying to assemble and decide you know how they're going to approach these pieces how to um, which versions of different components work well together and you know inevitably everyone ends up you know using the pieces that that add value or solve problems they have and ignoring the ones that don't um, but developing all that and maintaining all that is is challenging and it you know when we when we talk about that darren and i we always think that back to you know we've been working in cloud computing now since around 2008 um, and if we think about these last 11 years, you know, the, the, the biggest similarity to, you know, kind of what people are going through right now is, you know, is what emerged around uh, around the early, you know, 2010, 2011, this, this idea of platform as a service or PaaS 
platforms that you know set out to create a uh, a framework that was horizontally integrated set of capabilities that would make it easier to develop applications. And when we think about horizontally integrated, these really went all the way from you know the user experience, building code to deploying that code to operating and running that code, all the way down to managing infrastructure. You know, deploying VMs, scaling infrastructure, um, scheduling workloads, and the um, you know I've, I've kind of highlighted some of the examples of this that, that have emerged over the last four or five years. Companies like you know Pivotal and Open Red Hat's OpenShift are, are, are you know really the leading platform as a service products back in the, in the early days of this space. Uh, but other companies like Apprenda and Apsara built you know implementations of this, and they were always positioned as these really opinionated approaches to running applications where they integrated the stack. They abstracted away, you know, the concept of the application from the infrastructure, and they were built in a way that was portable for the most part, right? They could run on most VMs, most OSs, run run in most places. So they kind of sat above Linux, but but ran anywhere. And um, and this was, you know, this was this was wildly successful um, in terms of you know the attention people got with with the idea of a PaaS, but a lot less success, successful when it came to actually implementing, building, and driving this. And, and I think a lot of the reasons is these were these were massive projects, right? A PaaS platforms were kind of built and sold to IT departments. They were built at like a CIO level in a, in a company as this is how we are going to, you know, adopt cloud native applications, how we're going to build 12 factor applications. This is our PaaS. You know, you would you would go through a big project of implementing it, kind of designing all of your policies, um, you know, You'd run this project for years, build it out, uh, build it on top of you know a couple different infrastructure platforms, and you know I think it'd be fair to say that nobody would ever try to employ two of these, or very few people would go undertake running different passes. They they really were pretty mutually exclusive. You kind of adopted one and went forward. Um, the 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 complaints about paths were always that it was um, be that opinionated nature meant that they were relatively restrictive if it, if it met your work your requirements it was great if it didn't meet your requirements you couldn't really use it and you know because they were fully integrated they often were very late to incorporate new technologies like like containers and kubernetes in many ways um you know really disrupted this whole PaaS movement because it offered something very portable and, and solved a lot of the same problems that it has built so you know as we were looking at the current model that you know the the current we've kind of swung you can think of this pendulum from you know you know maybe at the peak of paz enthusiasm was like you know let let uh you know let the cloud foundry organization define you know all of the tooling and just build your apps to now we've kind of swung back in the direction of it's it's a smorgasbord of options build your salad from the salad bar and, and go to town and um and i think that's you know when, when we were working, when we work with teams, there's pros and cons to that. And we, we really thought there, there there was the potential for a gap, you know, between those two things. This this idea um, develop that, that we think of as a micro pass. Um, and the focus on this micro pass concept was to keep what we really liked about pass. So, you know, the integration of multiple components together to get us, you know, a sum that's, that's greater than the, the, or a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts, I guess. Um, you know, to build something that was kind of expecting multi-tenancy that knew that there were going to be different applications that need to be running on it, um, to abstract away some of the infrastructure operations. You know, in a lot of ways, you know, we were we were in, you know thinking about serverless and thinking about you know how do we how do we get closer to a um, a DevOps team being able to describe what they want and not have to really get down into the weeds on what type of infrastructure they're running on, and obviously wanting this thing to run anywhere. But at the same time, you know, keep it really lightweight. Keep it as something that was not an IT project to implement. Keep it as something that, you know, would go with you wherever you found Kubernetes and could run on it. So we wanted to develop like just enough platform to leverage the power of Kubernetes in the ecosystem without, um, without requiring a lot of heavy duty configuration and centralized planning for how this thing would run. Um, we wanted to make it really modular so that all of the functionality was there, but was sort of optional. You could use what you wanted. You, you didn't necessarily need to consume everything. Um, we wanted to make sure it would run in every Kubernetes cluster. But the big thing we, we thought about was we wanted to be like a, um, like a really good house guest, right? We couldn't come in and just take over the cluster because the expectation wasn't that 
Rio was going to have an embedded Kubernetes, but rather that Kubernetes, you know, I might have a Kubernetes cluster where someone wants to run Rio on it. And when you change that expectation, then, you know, you don't expect to be, um, you know, the, the only thing running on the cluster. You kind of come in with an expectation that you'll be able to run this on the cluster without necessarily taking over the cluster. And that meant, you know, one other big thing is that we didn't want to make, you know, the, what we think of as kind of the, the main cardinal sin of PaaS, which is to assume that, you know, a PaaS is, is some concept of perfection, that it's going to solve everything. We sort of thought there might be lots of approaches to a micro PaaS. You know, we see, um, you know, you can almost see some of these evolving in the cloud space where, where, where um, you know, Amazon has their, um, their Fargate service, which is kind of like a, a micro PaaS in the sense of it, it abstracts away the infrastructure, just says run containers. Um, Google just introduced this Google Run, which in a lot of ways is very similar to what Rio does and, and what, you know, the approach we're trying to take, which is just, you know, allow users to write their applications and deploy without having to necessarily get into the weeds of knowing everything about, uh, you know, cluster administration and managing all the infrastructure. So, um, at the same time, you know, we, we set all this up with the expectation that if you wanted to use the capabilities in Kubernetes, this shouldn't obscure those or restrict you from using anything else. So that it was it was built to be very, very Kubernetes native and to feel really comfortable almost if you with the expectation that you would kind of grow from using uh, it, you know, if you needed to, to add, take advantage of all the capabilities that were there, both in Kubernetes and even in the broader ecosystem. And, and so that's what we've built with Rio. It is, it is meant to be a, um, a micro PaaS built completely as CRDs on top of Kubernetes. Um, it incorporates some other really powerful technology besides Kubernetes, including Istio and Prometheus, Knative, Let's Encrypt. Um, and you know we expect it to, to be alive. It's gonna continue to change and grow as new projects come in that, that we think make it easier and more valuable to build and deploy applications. Um, it, it solves, a, you know, it really addresses a lot of common capabilities that require you to bridge between these different services. So, you know, Git-based continuous delivery and builds, um, automatic configuration of DNS, uh, you know, HTTPS or TLS certificate management, you know, HTTP-based routing, um, HTTP-based monitoring and metrics, uh, auto-scaling, the ability to do all sorts of different kinds of deployments, Canary, AB, Blue Green, et cetera. And so we, we really built this with, you know, with the expectation that the point of connecting these services was to enable new things, right? Can I scale based on, uh, you know, metrics coming out of Istio that understands the number of sessions running against the service? Um, you know, how do we, how do we balance those things together and make it really easy? So that's, really what we've built. And Darren's going to take you through, um, you know, he's the chief architect of this project. He's really worked very much on it uh, every day for, for a while now. And he's going to take you through the project, introduce it. I'll, I'll be answering your questions as you post them to the questions channel. And um, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Darren, can I make you the presenter now? Yep. Give me one second. There we are. Okay, you should be the presenter now. Okay, yep. Let me share my screen. Okay, should be able to see my screen. Okay, so I'm yeah, gonna yeah. run through um, and demo this to the best of my abilities. Um, as Shannon said, um, you know, this is all live and, um, you know, uh, Nothing's like kind of pre-canned or anything like that. So things might fail. We'll see. Um, just kind of to, to kind of level set and talk about like kind of what's the kind of the what uh, kind of the, the level of, I, I guess, the like where we are with Rio. Like we would say Rio is an alpha project right now. And so um, so it's, you know, it, it's pretty early. Um, but it actually, since it's built on top of like Istio and Knative and some other well-known components, it's actually fairly, it, it works pretty well um, right now. But 
um, but we still do have like kind of the the alpha tag on it because basically like we are still rapidly changing it. So API might change, interface might change. You know, we're getting a lot of feedback from um, community and, and things like that right now. Um, but it it should be you know I'll, you'll see all the functionality it has. I mean, it has really a lot of functionality already. Majority you know these things work. They're not like super buggy and everything. So, um, but we are still calling it basically an alpha. Um, so. In order to install Rio, uh, the the Rio is basically um, the Rio is basically two parts. There's a CLI, and there's the server side component, which is a controller. You can also look at it as kind of like an operator. Um, so, in order to install Rio, you really need to install the server side component. Um, that would typically, if you're running in a more controlled environment, that would usually be done by an administrator uh, they would set up rio and then the cluster supports rio and then any user can use the um, the kubernetes types for the cli so to install there's a lot of different ways to install the easiest way to get going is just from the cli so um, to download that you can just go to the github releases just pick the latest release it's uh, 011 rc5 right now we'll have 011 out uh, you know probably today um, but right now the RC5 is, is the latest. Uh, so the CLI, you know, we have that on uh, Mac, Linux, and Windows, um, and on ARM too for Linux. Um, so you can just download that. Um, so it's just that one binary. You can also, there's a curl script too that just, you know, kind of makes it a little easier um, on, you know, just installing it into your path and stuff like that. But either which way, like all they really, all it really is is just one. It's uh, just one binary. So it's going to be git rio.io pipe that to shell, and then that will install the binary. Okay. So now we have the the rio command line. So if I run, you know, kind of this is you can see this is the version I'm using RC5 right now. So to install rio into a cluster, you're just going to run rio install. Um, I actually. So Rio will work on any Kubernetes, um, in any Kubernetes 1.13 or greater. Um, you know, there's always little caveats with different clusters, but we're trying, we, you know, testing, you know, GKE, EKS, AKS, Minikube, like all the various things. Um, and so right now, you know, to the best of our knowledge, it's working on pretty much all the, the main, kind of the mainstream distributions. Um, the one little thing, to kind of know ahead of time when you're installing Rio is we're going to create a service load balancer. So if your cluster doesn't support service load balancing, um, we try to actually detect that, but if we don't detect it, you can actually change that to switch to host ports. So instead of using a service load balancer for the um, for the for all the communication, the, all the ingress traffic, we can use host ports instead. Um, but basically, so if you want to install, you can just run Rio install. That's going to do the installation. If for whatever reason you don't want to like do this interactively, you, you want to manage it a different way, you can just do dash dash YAML and that will print out the YAML and you can you can just run that um, you know like through kubectl apply. Um, since I I'm running this just on my laptop, um, just against uh, I have a K3s cluster running on my laptop. Um, so that typically when you run the install, it's going to take it might take like up to five minutes. It's mostly just pulling images because it's got to pull all these things. Um, so it'll sit here and wait for it all to pull and make sure it comes up. Um, the Once it's up, you can run Rio info. That will give you kind of an idea of like if the system's healthy. Uh, the Rio install kind of already checks that the system's healthy. Um, but you can see the, the versions, the cluster domain and like what IP it's assigned to. Um, and if you're having any in, in problems with the, uh, in, like the, it's like, it's not coming up, you run Rio install and it's just sitting there waiting forever. You can run Rio system logs and that will give you a little better idea, hopefully of like, if something's failing, um, um, you know, so you can help troubleshoot or, or whatever. You know. So, um, so once you have Rio, Rio installed, uh, so as I said before, like what, when you install it, it's just going to deploy a controller. 
uh, like our, you know, basically the, the Rio controller, which will then, uh, it also, the Rio controller will then set up Istio, uh, Knative, Let's Encrypt, like Cert Manager. Um, it, so it installs a couple components so that, you know, we get all the functionality that we need for Rio. Um, right now, actually the requirements is like, you need about three gigabytes uh, of memory, like you know, on your cluster. To, to kind of start getting going. That's kind of a huge amount of memory in my mind of like kind of the starting point. So like in a, a release very soon, we're gonna drastically really re reduce that. But like the way that some things are packaged, they're just using too much memory right now. But um, so once you install Rio, so Rio is gonna go and it's gonna create a series of uh, custom resources. And so everything with Rio is just interacting with the custom resources. So everything, like I'm going to be demoing the CLI a lot. The CLI is just there to make the experience really nice and, you know, has a lot of little niceties built in, but everything can be done through kubectl and interacting directly with the types. And I'll kind of go back and forth as I'm demoing this and I'll show some of the underlying types because even just interacting with the types, it's pretty simple too. They're very simple types. Um, so when you install um, Rio, the types, I'm going to show you uh, this UI I have. Um, that is brought up here. This is a kind of a yet to be released uh, rancher little project that we have that's a kind of an object browser for Kubernetes, um, but allows you to just see everything that's in, in your cluster. But it kind of helps me show what type of resources get created uh, for Rio. So primarily what, you, what you're concerned about, we create two different, uh, two different API groups. One is for administrator, like there's a admin Rio IO, and this is creating some of the admin level stuff. I'm not gonna go over any of that for the most part, except for public domain, I'll talk about that. But this is for like, because Rio out of the box, like, you know, a lot of stuff just kind of like magically works. But if you're running in a more controlled environment, you know, maybe you don't wanna use Let's Encrypt or you don't wanna use our automatic DNS or, you know, there's a lot of different things like how you wanna set up the ingress and stuff like that. That's all kind of, change through the, the admin objects and and you can tweak this extensively. Um, I'm not going to cover that in, the, in this demo. I'm mostly just going to be fo focused on the user level stuff and that's these types here. So out of these types, um, you can see we have app, external service, router, and service. For the most part, you really care mostly about service. App is actually just a fully managed ob object. You never create them. They're just more to help us aggregate and track status of, of things. But primarily what you're doing in, in uh, Rio is you're creating services. Uh, and then with these other two types here uh, is, this is a, a router. This is so you can do kind of, um, uh, kind of like API gateway type functionality. Uh, so on your traffic, you can route things based off host name and, and like host name or path or cookies and, uh, you can do a lot of fancy stuff, and I'll demo that all later. And then external services is, is the way that you can bind external things into Rio. So you can see, um, you can access services like across namespaces or across clusters or, or um, uh, you know, just completely unmanaged external things like, a, you know, RDS database or something like that. Um, so primarily what, what you're going to be doing is service. So service is kind of the kind of the magical object for, for Rio. Pretty much everything re revolves around service. Okay, so so what I'm gonna do is, uh, like when I ran Rio install uh, before, let me see, I'll, I'll just do this again. It gave like a little example. It's like, you know, run this. Um, I'm gonna kind of do something similar. I'm gonna run, um, this one is is pulling, the, the demo here is pulling from a Git repo. I'm not gonna start with a Git repo. We'll, I'll get into that later as I demo the stuff. Um, but so to run any service or create a service, you just do Rio run. Um, and you can, uh, I can show you help. There's tons of parameters if you wanna get more fancy, um, doing all various different things. Um, but for the most part, all you really need is just an image. Uh, so I'm gonna do I build a cloud. Like you just need to pass an image name and, and that, that should be uh, blue. Um, <clears throat> so by default, um, the, the default behavior is we're expecting like when you deploy an image like this, like 
Um, so the we're expecting by default that the uh, the pro the the image is is or the container that gets spun up is listening on port 8080 uh, with HTTP. So you can change that, but that's kind of the default behavior. So like this one, that's why like I don't need to set up any other parameters. I can just do this because we just already assume that container is listening on port 8080 on HTTP. Uh, and then we can just kind of magically set up everything. If your service is listening on a different port, uh, then you can just change it with the, with the dash P, the, the port command here. So basically, you know, what did I do when I ran this like Rio run? So all that's doing is creating, if I just go back to kubectl, I say get services Rio cattle.io. Okay, so that when I when I do this Rio run, that's just basically it created a service in the default namespace here, and I can uh, let's see, I can just get this one. Exactly. Uh, YAML. Um, so you can look at here in the spec. So basically what it did was it set up a service. This is the image. Um, and then we default to some auto scaling parameters and I'll talk about auto scaling kind of later. Um, but again, I was saying like we expect, oops, shoot, I did like a weird copy and paste. Uh, uh, right here. Um, we, by default, we set up like port 80 is mapped to port 8080 on, on the container. Um, so basically like doing that run, it just creates this little spec here. And so um, it's a pretty simple type. The majority of these parameters you can actually just drop to. You pretty much just need image and then the port if you want. Okay, so once I do that, you know, basically what's that doing? That's, that's just uh, deploying a service, a real service. And at this point, the behavior of this is gonna look and behave a lot like just like a deployment. It's like, well, it's a thing running. Um, so we created deployment service, all those things under the hood. Like if I was to say like get deploy, uh, you'll see there's actually a deployment here. Um, we created some services uh, for that and a bunch of other like Knative objects and, stuff and, and whatnot. Um, um, but so immediately you can see we have this URL here. So when you install Rio, we automatically set up DNS uh, for your cluster. And we just issue a, when I say Rio info here, you can see, we set up, um, we give your cluster a, dom a domain name. So this is just a DNS service that we're running publicly. Um, again, this can be like in a controlled environment, this can be swapped out with a different DNS system and you can fully manage this and you can set up the DNS yourself if you want to and not even use our DNS. You just have to set up a kind of a wildcard domain. Um, but so, but just for like the regular open source user, like as soon as you run Rio, you already you automatically get um, a public uh, domain. Uh, and then also you notice here it's HTTPS. So if I go and I open up this URL, you notice uh, the, it's a valid certificate. So we also automatically set up Let's, Let's Encrypt and give you a valid certificate like a valid production let's encrypt let's encrypt certificate. So this app, um, so you know, by just saying, you know, Rio run with this thing, this thing already has a, a you know a public domain with SSL, DNS, it's already set up. You don't have to worry, you know, kind of worry about that. Um, I'll talk about later how you set up like vanity domains instead of using the you know auto generated stuff. Um, but right now that you know this is you know kind of uh, uh, what we have. So, um, let's see. So now that we have, we have this, uh, you know, kind of this, this one thing running, let me just go through a little bit, just this one service running. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through the CLI a little bit to just kind of show you how the CLI, like kind of the user experience of the CLI, how you interact with objects and whatnot. Um, so it's kind of like, I like to think it kind of takes a, the best things from kind of like the Docker and kubectl and kind of combines them a little bit. So, um, cause you'll notice like PS is kind of, that's the way that, you know, you kind of get an overview of all your services and kind of what's going on. Um, run is how you create services. Uh, 
there's scale, scale, weight, promote, stage. I'll go through these in just a little bit. This is about like um, creating versions of, uh, of services. But if you want to delete any object, you can just do RM and put in the name of the object. Inspect is going to give you a raw, basically the same thing. It's just doing it, giving you the Kubernetes object. So I can just say, okay, like Rio inspect um, here. Okay. Oops, the service. And so that, that gives me like the raw, you know, Kubernetes object with all of its, you know, verbosity. Um, but there's also export. So what you can do is with any of the, the types within Rio, you can then just do export. And what we do is we just kind of sanitize these things to, to make them you know, nice and clean so you can export this easily to a YAML so you can move it over to a different environment. So like we've really put a lot of thought into the structure of these objects and, and whatnot to make sure that they everything can be properly managed like in a Git-based workflow, um, you know, uh, you know, through like kubectl apply or through Helm or, or just, you know, we want to make sure, you know, there's, there's kind of nothing we're doing with these objects, like through the CLI that would make it so it'd be hard to automate or plug into a CI CD workflow or something like that. So you can easily export any type. If you had a bunch of services running, you can actually just say, okay, export the whole namespace and it would just export all the services. Um, uh, and so everything is like nice and clean. Um, going back to the, what are the other commands? So we have edit. So edit is very similar to just kubectl edit. The only difference is like, um, we just make it a little nicer in terms of, if you go Rio edit here, um, you'll see, uh, basically we drop all the, the stuff that you can't even change because there's no point in like showing like in a normal kubectl uh, edit, like it has like status and all the other stuff. Um, the majority of that you can't really change and, and it just kind of confuses users to a certain degree of like, hey, I want to edit this and there's all these other fields. Um, but if for some reason you really do want like all of that, uh, you know, everything, you can just say edit raw and then that gives you like the full objects with everything. Um, but again, it's just trying to make this, you know, just, you know, really easy, um, you know, because really under the hood, the types that we're using, I, I, I just, you know, they're really kind of basic. So. Um, you shouldn't be too confused with all the other kind of boilerplate that Kubernetes adds on top. Okay, um, let me just see if there's anything else. So uh, logs, uh, so basically logs, you can just get logs from any service or a pod or a, or a build <clears throat> that's going on when you're doing the Git-based builds. Um, um, okay, the, there's the console. So we actually have built into the CLI also is the... Um, is the uh is like kind of a two-e interface and we're still tweaking this but like but basically like you know you can get a list of like all your apps or your builds or or whatever like here i'm looking at this app if i hit it hit enter i can go into the revisions and then the pods of it and then all the containers of that pod um from here i can very easily like just get the um this is a log tail output what's going on with that or you can do you can like um uh, execute uh, a shell on you know one of the pods or whatever just directly from uh, the UI and so we have this kind of TUI interface a text user I uh, user interface um, you know just to make it really easy to kind of interact with this you can inspect the objects edit them you know uh, whatever all through that that interface um, so again you know it's like everything we're just trying to make it as simple and easy just kind of hopefully make it quite delightful to use this. Okay, so th that was just kind of an overview of just kind of the, the user experience or whatever. So you would just get an idea as I go through and edit and change things and, and whatever kind of the overall how, how the Rio CLI works. Um, but going back to kind of the core functionality of the services. So um, when I deployed this service, so I deployed this one service here, um, let me open this back up. Okay. So I deployed a service. If I go, I can just go and edit this service. You know, as I showed before, I can just go and edit this. If I edited this service, it would just, you know, I could change the imaging, I could change the scale, I could change the parameters, I could do whatever I want. It would just work the same as like a editing a deployment. Like it would just, it rolls out a new, you know, cause it is a deployment under the hood. It, it like just rolls out new pods 
or whatever. Um, that's just kind of like your regular Kubernetes behavior. So the thing that gets more interesting with Rio is when you start looking at creating multiple revisions of a service. So the basic idea here is that uh, in order to do things like a canary deployments or AB or, or um, blue green type deployments, you really need like uh, you, you have a service, you need to be able to deploy like two versions of that at the same time and then control the traffic and control the traffic to those two, two different services or multiple services, however you want. So whenever you create a service, you can just create a plain old service that just runs as a regular deployment. But every service also has uh, fields on them for app and version. So the app, uh, the app and version on the on a service object that ties together all those services into like a group. So you know, like these two different services are actually associated to each other. Um, they're the same application, but two different versions. And so let me just kind of demo, you know, show what what I mean by that. And so here I've just deployed um, this application, which uh, right now it. it I deployed the blue version, so it, it makes these little cows blue. And I just want to call out, like, this is a this is a demo. We picked this up. Uh, this is uh, kind of from a couple of years back. Evan Hazlitt put this together for a Docker demo, Docker demo, and we had kind of uh, forked it and add functionality, and we use it for things or whatever. But, um, but it's just, you know nice little thing that Evan had put together, and you know we're still using it. Um, so. If I want to go and stage a new version, so what I can do is I can say, okay, Rio stage. Um, what you do, uh, you have two options. You can just easily change the image because the, the, a lot of the times when you're deploying a new version of something, you're just changing the image. So that's just kind of super easy. You just um, from here, I can just say, okay, I build the cloud demo. So I deployed the blue one, so I'll do a green one. Green. And then uh, what's the service like? So I'm staging a new version of this of this service here. And then I can give it an, a version number. So like this is going to be V1. Okay. So when I do that, so now when I do and I run Rio PS, you'll see actually nothing really changes here. Um, because my my running service is is not actually impacted by staging a new version. But if I go and I say, okay, Rio revision, which will give me the revisions, I'll see, I, okay, I had the uh, the V0, which I first deployed, which was blue. And then I created the the uh, V1 version, which, oops, I gotta stop doing that. Um, I deployed the V1 version, which is using the green image. So going back here, you can see like I staged this new thing. It's in fact scaled to zero, it's running. Um, but you see my, my existing application is still just running and it's blue. Now, if I look here, you can see when I run Rio PS, this, is, this domain here, you can see is, it's, it's the way this is structured, it's the name, Eloquent Darwin 7, and then default, which is the namespace. Um, so you can see this is the main endpoint for this application. Um, now that I have two revisions of this application, uh, you can see over here for the revision, I have 100% of the weight going to V0 and 0% of the weight going to V1. So basically when I stage a new version, no traffic is going to it. It's all, everything's still going to the, the latest one. But I set up all like real will automatically set up a URL specific to that application to that revision. So if I want, I can go here and say, okay, let me just open up that URL, hit that, and now you can see like I'm getting a green background. So here I have a blue and a green. So so you can see like so this is like I could I could have my live running application and then I can deploy a new version of it and I can test it out using the this you know, test the, the version specific domain, you know, make sure that everything's good. There's, there's no issues with or whatever. So now that I've got two of these things running, I can start moving traffic over. So I can say, okay, real weight. Um, this is changing the, the weighting of the load balancing. Um, so like right now, the, this one's a hundred, that one's zero. So what I want to do now is say, okay, well, for this thing that I just deployed this new service here, 
I want this to be um, at 50%. Okay, so now when I run Rio revision, you should see, okay, it's at, um, oh, okay, so there's, sorry, there's one, let me just do this real quick. Um, no rollout. Okay. Okay, so I'll explain what rollout is in a bit, but like right now, like I'm, if I don't do rollout, it will just set the weight directly to what I asked it asked it to do. Um, so when I do that, now when I go back to my application, this is the main URL, the URL for the book. You can see now uh, both blue and green are showing up because it's load balancing 50% of the traffic to each one. Uh, I still have the old URL, where I mean the, the version specific one that's just showing the green traffic. Um, but now I have have the uh, you know the blue the um, the mixture of the two. So as soon as I'm if uh, as soon as I'm happy with uh, you know that new version you know so I've deployed it I'm not seeing any you know new errors or any issues or or whatever then you can run um, Rio promote which will basically whatever service you put revision you put in here, it will make it the primary one. It'll shift all the traffic over. But I want to show a couple um, parameters here in the promote is there's rollout increment and rollout interval and then uh, no rollout. So what rollout means like for, for the stuff that we're doing in Rio is we will slowly move traffic. So if you say like, okay, I want 100% of the traffic to go to this service and you do it and, and it's in like the rollout mode, it's not gonna go directly to 100%. It's going to slowly move it according to the increment and interval. Um, so you'll see that here. So if I say Rio promote, so the default is to, to do the, the rollout behavior. So if I say, okay, Rio promote, uh, this service. Now, if I just watch, I'll show you, watch Rio PS. Um, you can see I have two two revisions, V0, V1. They're both scaled to one and one, but the weight is 40. You can, so you can see the weights are changing. So it's slowly changing. And so the idea here is because we're also monitoring, and I'll go into the monitoring stuff in a second. Um, we're also monitoring all the traffic and the air rates and stuff like that. And so we can watch and see like as we're rolling out, if the errors increase, then we can stop it or we can, you know, we can do some type of action or whatever. Um, we're actually still working out some of that that like more advanced behavior. But but the idea here of being able to roll it out is like we have all the data available to us to make like intelligent decisions. And and so it's like if we start putting traffic and we see the air counts go up, um, you know, we can stop putting, you know, we can either halt it, don't put any more traffic on it, or roll it back. So I did that promote. Now if I go back to here, um, you can see all of the traffic is coming from green now. So I promoted that to the latest revision. Um, so if I run my Rio revision command, you can see the weight is at 0% for the old one. If I run Rio PS, it'll say, okay, the only revisions I have running right now are just the V1 re revision. Okay, I'm gonna put this back to 50%. Um, uh, uh, so I can show just um, show some of the uh, monitoring stuff, so you can see some of the traffic. Let me just make sure. Okay, that's that's running 50-50. Okay, so also when you install, so everything in Rio is running on top of a service mesh, so we automatically get like all this visibility and monitoring and information. Um, later versions of Rio will include all that kind of policy and MTLS and RBAC and you know all the all, some of the fancy security uh, features right now we're just focusing mostly on on routing and um, and visibility like monitoring so when you install Rio we automatically install the service mesh stuff so um, so if I do Rio PS that lists my services but there's a flag for dash s which is um, I'll show you in help or whatever. So this shows the system level things. So if I say Rio dash SP PS, this is actually uh, listing all the system level components that we've deployed. So if, if there's something going on wrong with Rio, you can also just use Rio to troubleshoot Rio itself. Because 
we use Rio to deploy all of the Rio services. I mean, this is kind of how we validated that, you know, kind of Rio has sufficient functionality because we're able to deploy very complicated systems like Istio and whatnot with Rio itself. Um, so we have a couple things that we're, we have deployed here. Um, so these are the various services. Um, again, I was saying like, we're gonna be collapsing these down quite a bit. Um, you know, there's kind of different approaches that we're working on to make this a lot more lightweight. Um, right now, Rio is just a CLI, so we don't have any any UI. Um, so I'm pulling right now. We're pulling in just some of the open source components uh, to to kind of do UI. We are working on UI for for Rio. So as we build like a proper first class rancher Rio UI, um, some of these things we probably won't install by default. But when I when I run this um, so I have automatically uh, Grafana, and and also just a caveat here. But again, this is like it's this is Rio is alpha. It's early. Please don't put this in production. There are some known security things about it, specifically like the fact that we install like Grafana and and Kiali with no authentication. Um, like so, we're working on properly securing those, but but they are open to the world right now. So so please. Um, there's a way to turn turn them off and whatnot, but but these hey, are like Garrett, little things. Yeah. Whenever you get to a space, I've got loads and loads of questions and things, but I don't, don't yeah, want so to let me, stop. I'm going to show point. the monitoring stuff, and I think I'll be a good point to pause because then I can get into like the next phase. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I was actually kind of curious because I've been I feel like I've been talking forever now. Okay, so um, so so again, uh, so we have all this data coming from Istio and, 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 and any, so eventually Rio will support other service meshes besides Istio, like we've been involved in the SMI um, work and we're very interested in supporting other service meshes, but like right now it's just Istio. Um, but so you can see already, um, you know, here is like, um, here's some of the traffic that's going on in my, in my cluster. I can see uh, you know, for whatever reason, Kiali uh, has some errors here. Everything else seems to be running 100%. That's going good. These are my services that I deployed. Um, oh, wait, no, those are, I think there's some old ones. Um, let me see, where's my namespace? Uh, these are older ones or whatever. Um, yeah. Where's the other? Oh, anyways, let me go over to like Kiali. I'll show you. So, um, so here from Kiali, we can see. Okay, so if I go to like the default, I think it's it's easier to show with this graph view here. So you can see, um, uh, right now, like I had that that this one service. Uh, um, sorry, what was it called? Yeah, it was Eloquent Darwin Seven. So you can see here, like, um. We have the Istio gateway, which is uh, that's pull, that's where the ingress traffic comes comes in. Traffic is flowing right now through there. It's it's hitting this application and it's being like equally load balanced between V0 and V1. And if you click on like any of these things, you get like you know metrics of you know these are good and bad. Um, so I'll go into kind of the after I pause for questions, I'll go into more detail. Um, or I'll, I'll, I'm going to go through some examples of doing, putting some load on this and um, auto scaling and, and whatnot. So, um, but anyway, so you can kind of get an idea of the, the information that you're already kind of getting like out of the box, because once I start showing you some of the air stuff, the air stuff, you can see it's like it will automatically identify, hey, this one service is failing. You can see that immediately. Um, and this is all coming from the kind of the service mesh functionality, but like all this stuff, you know, it's just out of the box, it just immediately works with Rio, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, I think um, I will pause right there, Shannon, and we can take some questions. Okay, sorry, I was muted there. Yeah, I, I have loads of questions going back almost 30 minutes here. Um, you know, I've been answering lots of them, but there's lots that require a little bit more of your time. Why don't I start with one in a few times, and it was about Helm. Um, does Rio install Helm on the Kubernetes cluster? Someone else asked the question. Um, 
no, Rio does not use Helm in any way. Um, we will at some point here be producing Helm charts for Rio, so you can install Rio through Helm. Um, but Rio itself does not use Helm, so we don't install it. We don't use it. Um, it every like the deployments of things are just managed in different ways. Um, okay, another question was, would would um, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just going through all these questions here. Is is Rio deployed as a container on the cloud? Sujit asked. Sorry, uh, Shannon, I think either me or you, one of us is, is, is cutting out a little bit. Um, so you're you're asking. Oh, okay. Um, I think it must be. But he was asking, is it deployed as a container? Is Rio deployed as a container on a uh, pod? Like, is, is how does yes. Rio get deployed? What's maybe the architecture? Maybe we can just talk through that. Yeah, so um, you can just basically see if you look at everything we have is in the, uh, the Rio system namespace. Um, oops, get deployed. Um, so we have like the main Rio controller is just a deployment here. And then we're running a series of other components. These are autoscaler, build controller, all these various things. Um, so there's all just kind of deployments that are running in the cluster. Oh, and then also if you don't like Rio or want to get rid of it or whatever, um, you can just run Rio uninstall and that will do a pretty darn good job of removing Rio um, because, you know, if anyone's, you know, kind of installed kind of these more complex systems or whatever, there's finalizers and there's all the CRDs and there's all this nonsense. Um, so the Rio uninstall goes through and deletes objects and the controllers, removes finalizers, cleans up custom resources. Um, so it just a good job of deleting itself um but yeah so everything so that's why like so rio like this way it will run anywhere um because we make no assumptions beyond kubernetes like as long as you got a standard kubernetes it, it works and so everything's deployed as kubernetes resources um we just use kubernetes api and stuff um another question that lots of different versions have come up of which is how does rio um address stateful containers. I, I, I kind of answered a question or earlier. I said, you know, predominantly Rio is built for stateless apps, but uh, there were a lot of questions about stateful. And I thought, um, I know you bet you put a lot of thought into stateful containers and, and you know, kind of a long-term approach or what you'd like to do there. So do you want to just talk yeah. a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. So the, um, so there's a lot of neat functionality in Rio around, you know, and I'll be showing this more around like auto scaling and automatic, like Git deployments and automatic rollout and stuff like that. So a lot of the, the behavior of those things, um, uh, you know, makes assumptions that you can basically kill and create containers at, at will. Um, so that doesn't work very well for stateful stuff. So right now, Rio is, is the current functionality of Rio is focused on stateless. Um, so if you're going to be running stateful workloads, you know, we say, okay, we'll just, you know, fall back to kind of traditional Kubernetes approaches right now. But we are, we're getting a lot of, because I mean, basically what we've seen is that we've shown people Rio, they're like, it's so easy to use. Can I use that also for stateful? And so we are adding functionality in for stateful. It's just it, the stateful stuff um, becomes a lot more static. We can't do a lot of the kind of magical auto scaling and you know automatic deployments and stuff because stateful applications you really treat in a different way. Um, so yeah, so we're, um, so we will be adding in, you know, basically kind of like volume support and the ability to, um, effectively kind of manage stateful sets under the hood. But right now, Rio, so the current functionality, stateless and stateful, uh, will come down, down the pipeline. Um, so there was another question. David asked if all three Knative capabilities were supported, build, eventing, and servicing. No. So, um. So right now, what's in the current code base of Rio, we're actually very lightly using Knative. Um, we're using build as is, and then we're using just a little bit of, of auto scaling. Um, but the reasons for like why we aren't using more of it just has more to just do with timing and resources and whatnot. So we are actually right now uh, doing a lot of effort around integrating more of Knative. Um, 
so K Native Build, we're moving from K Native Build to Tecton, which is is kind of the newer, greater version of K Native Build. It kind of supersedes it, or I mean, it has a lot more functionality. So we're moving um, we're moving everything over to Tecton, which is going to be great because we're going to be at a lot of we can add a lot of pipeline functionality to Rio. Um, we are moving before we were using just a little bit of their auto scaling code. Now we're trying to pick up the entire auto scaling framework. Um, because it, it is very tricky like we got our stuff working but we would much rather collaborate with the community around doing like scale to zero and, and there's a lot of little caveats there and doing it efficiently and, and whatnot um, so eventing is so the kind of the, the roadmap right now is we 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 want to be um, kind of in line with Knative for for build slash tecton um, and auto scaling we most likely right now won't pick up serving because serving um is uh there's there's some technical issues with serving so like if we can work those ones out but like serving is a little more restrictive of a model than than we'd like to to use with with rio um little things like um uh like rio right now still supports sidecars so you can do like multiple containers in a pod but serving doesn't and, and we have these re kind of requirements from existing users and whatnot who like you know that um because they're, they're not just looking at like uh, a function based platform they, they want to just you know kind of just run apps or whatever um so serving is going to be we don't know if we will be able to pick that up but then we're looking heavily at, at eventing it's trying to figure out what's the best approach uh for eventing um so like right now there is no uh eventing in rio Um, there was another question about, uh, this one's from Yusuf, he said, Rio creates a certificate in each deployment or is wildcard, uh, right, yeah, so, example.com issuing a certificate domain. Right, so, um, what we do is, um, we create, we create a wildcard certificate. So every domain, so every cluster gets a wild, like, um, when I said like Rio info here, uh, we give you a wildcard certificate. So it's star dot whatever your cluster domain is. So uh, like our interaction with Let's Encrypt for the most part, just once up front. Well, and then besides renewing it, um, Cert Manager actually, we're just using Cert Manager for all this. So that's why it's infinitely flexible and you can change a lot of the stuff. Um, but so uh, we just issue one wildcard certificate uh this is also i mean yeah so there's the, the you can not use let's encrypt and you can not use cert manager also you can manage this yourself there's infinite ways to configure this um the only the other certs that we issue is when you start getting into like the vanity domains of you know i have my you know my production.com you know so i want a you know a proper public url not this auto generated thing so what uh rio has right now um so you just you say Rio domain uh, and you register uh, you just register a domain so it's like this would be uh, well this is, says like foo.bar but that'd be like production.com to the, goes to this service and then we know uh, you know this public URL needs to be routed to to whatever so when that happens if you have the let's encrypt feature turned on in Rio um, Rio has this concept of features that I didn't really talk about where you can you know, turn these things on and off. Um, but if you have the Let's Encrypt feature turned on, we will issue a certificate specifically for that domain. So that one's not a wildcard. Um, so for the vanity domains, we also issue certificates too. Um, and again, you can turn it off if you don't want it. Aaron, there was a couple questions more that kind of go back to that Helm discussion. Um, and it, you know, Greg asked, I think, well, he said, if Rio doesn't really work with Helm charts, how do you package an application for deployment? Or is it meant to just deploy single images one at a time? Right, so um, so that's kind of like the nice thing of like, so everything in Rio, so as I was saying before, like whatever I'm doing from the CLI is just making the experience nice. But like, um, so like right now I've created, let's say like this this service and, and whatnot, um, this this service with two different revisions or this app with two different revisions i can just say like rio export default and i can just get the kubernetes resources and then i can just manage these however i want so i can put these resources into a helm chart um you can you know depending on how you want to want to do that 
Um, so because these are just Kubernetes resources, they'll fit into any workflow you want. Uh, there's I'll I'll be showing you the like the Git based deployments and the automated stuff we have. So it's like Rio is going to have its own kind of C continuous delivery pipeline type functionality. Or I mean, we have very basic functionality right now, but we're adding significantly more pipeline functionality. But but all of that stuff is is all is actually optional. Like if you don't want to use like our pipeline functionality, you can just take these services and just package them in Helm charts and and do whatever do whatever you um, kind of want there. Um, yeah. So I mean, ho hopefully that that kind of answers it. Um, yeah. So there's a, a bunch of bunch more questions, but I know you wanted to get into some other other things, maybe just one more, um, you know, I, I think I think you've answered this one about lots of these. Um, I think one of the questions was just about, you know, the alpha status, uh, you know, PKS, he said, is it that risky to go production with this alpha release? I think it's more secure than the normal case installations. If we fix the Grafana and Istio security, that will be enough, yeah. So any, any thoughts on that? I, I mean, I don't, yeah, I mean, I would prefer people don't go to production. If I mean, if you really want to, then actually just talk to us directly. Um, you know, contact us through Slack or something if you really want to put this in production. But I mean, uh, you know, we really just rolled this out to the public. I mean, so honestly, Rio is a project I've been working on for for almost a year, um, and it's gone through a lot of iterations. And and we've been, you know, we're at this point quite experts in the uh, whole service mesh space and whatnot. Uh, but the uh, we really just rolled it out to the public in, those, in this last month. So, you know, it's kind of, we just feel it's too early to say it's in, like, I mean, I just don't know. <laughs> so, so please don't put it into production quite yet. But, um, you know, the feedback and everything's been, been going really well. And so, you know, for us to move it to a beta status is, is like the way we work is like, we'll declare something beta. Um, We'll declare something beta, and what that means is we have a clear roadmap and time frame to when GA will happen, um, and then it will be a fully supported production thing. And then so once it goes into beta, then a lot of people start putting beta stuff into production, you know, and, and assume a little bit of the risk. So it's like for us to make that step and call it beta, it's just all based off of user demand. And um, you know, so we'll see. So if you, if you want us to, I think it also too comes into upgrade stuff, right? So right now, I think Andreas asked a question. He said, "How does upgrade work between like zero dot zero zero dot one dot one RC three to zero dot one dot one RC five? You know, what's the what's the way to upgrade of of this, and and what should, what will it look like as it matures?" Well, yeah. So it's um it's just uh, if you download the new CLI and just run Rio install, it will do the upgrade. Um, so, you know, once we put something out there, you know, even though this is alpha, you know, we really do, we, we really hate to tell people like, you're going to have to delete, you know, so we do try to make things upgradable, but like when it's in an alpha status, you know, we still kind of reserve the right to break something or, or maybe, you know, Hey, when you run the upgrade, you might have to run this manual step to, you know, do something or other um but like once it would hit a beta is that's when we would say okay no upgrades should work now um and then 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 for ga or whatever it should just be seamless or whatever um so the it's just basically yeah so the upgrade is just running rio install with the new cli um and and if you're not using rio cli the rio cli directly it's it's just whatever the yaml is basically so it's like you can just say like cube ctl apply dash f with you know like that so it's like if you just took that yaml so that's what i'm saying like in the future we will be producing helm chart for the rio runtime that needs to be installed in the cluster um and so like if that's your preferred method of managing things uh because you know from like our rancher product we do a lot with helm charts and you know we kind of you know prefer people to manage things a, a lot of that way all right, there's lots and lots and lots of questions, Aaron, but we're not going to get through anything if we don't keep moving. Why don't you okay. uh, why don't you dive in, and I'll keep doing my best to answer questions. I may tag somebody else in to come help. Yeah, so so every everything I've sh shown so far is is, is kind of like I'm, I'm trying to show kind of the the primitives, kind of what you can do with changing weights and how a service is separated into different revisions, and you can um, do the. Uh, um, 
you know, just basically just kind of like all the kind of the, the individual functionality. But so what I want to do now is kind of start tying it together more. You know, we can see more of an end-to-end -end use case of how all this can work. So there, there's uh, just, I think, like two more little features I'll show, and then I'll kind of try to do a, a, a better kind of end-to-end -end demo of how you can tie this all together if you want to use like holistically everything in Rio. Um, so everything I've done so far when I've said like Rio run uh, or, you know, created services, I've just been using Docker images, but um, we can also just, we can also in, uh, instead of pulling the image from a Docker repo, we can get it from Git and then we can do Git based builds. And this is all built on top of the Knative build and build templates. And so um, we're using build kit. That's kind of our preferred um, build daemon. And we're doing a lot actually with build kit to make it like fully rootless builds. Um, so it's all secure and stuff like that. Um, uh, so, you know, the, so basically um, what we can do is, is basically uh, pull the images from a Git, I mean, clone a Git repo and do the build, but then also monitor the repo depending on how you want to set up. So if I just say like, GitHub, uh, I build the cloud, let's see, rancher demo. Okay, so if I, if I do that, I should be able to say, okay, I have this service that I just created. And then at the end here, you can say waiting on build. And then if I say Rio build, you can say, okay, well, there's this new build that's going. And I can say Rio logs uh, or logs. Uh, oops. Okay, uh, yeah, and then the, this is going, and you know, so I'm just tailing the, the log. Oh, I think it already did it finish. It might have finished already. Uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So the, the it's line wrapping, but succeeded and, and true. So so basically, um, when I did this, uh, let me just I'll show you this service here that I created. This created a service here, and instead of in the spec putting an image, we do build and we put the branches master in the repo. And so this is just going to watch. It's going to watch this git this git repo. Um, there's a way. Um, we don't make it super easy at the moment. We're we're still adding functionality to the CLI. But basically, if we have a GitHub token, a GitHub token available to us, we can we'll actually set up a webhook. Um, on this repo, so as soon as it changes, we'll automatically be kicked off. We'll kick off new builds. Um, but if we don't have the token, then we just we fall back to a polling-based approach. So right now, it is doing a polling-based approach because I haven't configured the, the token. Um, and so when you do that, uh, I think it's like every 15 seconds or something like that, it checks. But if you do, if you point it to a repo in a branch, then it's basically going to watch that branch. And every single time there's a new version, uh, it's then going to do a new build and to create create a new revision. Uh, you can also just point it directly to a tag or a commit. And then at that point, it, we don't watch anything. because like we just pull the one thing and build it. Um, so you can very easily create a kind of a CD workflow here uh, by just watching something in, you know, watching a branch. So you can have like a production branch or a dev branch or whatever. So like we're using this to like, this is how we, you know, are, are setting up like our websites now, uh, you know, so as our developers can check in, um, you know, change the content on our, on our website, you know, does like the Jekyll or Hugo or whatever it is, build and sets up a new website and everything. So, you know, we can just easily monitor uh, branches. So we have different branches for uh, different developers or branches for like dev and, and, um, and production. So this sets up an automatic, like, you know, kind of very simple uh, pipeline. Um, so I want to show you, so so what happens is um, when it, when something changes, so right now I just did, I just did one simple, you know, uh, I just pointed it to master, nothing's changed, so it's created one revision. Uh, let me copy that, or let me open the URL. 
make sure this thing worked and it's running. Okay, so this, you know, this is running the, the blue version of the application. Uh, so if I go, let me switch to a different terminal here. Branch or demo. Uh, oh, I think I have a couple changes here. Okay, so this is running the blue one. So I'm going to switch it to green. Let me just commit. Um, so you can see in this diff here, I changed uh, from blue to green, the color. So I'm going to just yeah, do it. Does it support also, just a common question that's come in a bunch of times. Does it support GitHub or um, other Bitbucket or, or yeah, GitLab so we'll, or any other types of repos? Yeah, so we, um, uh, we're using a library from the drone developers um, called GoSCM, um, and it supports all those. Um, so as, cause I was saying like right now, uh, it's, it's technically feasible to add like a GitHub token and it will do web hooks and stuff like that, but we haven't made it super easy and, um, it's not very straightforward. So we're still working on like kind of the user experience went out. So when we do that, we'll, we'll, we'll throw in all the other providers that we have code for, which is all the major ones. So it's Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub, GitHub. Um, I can't remember what the other ones, but basically under the hood, we're using this library, go SCM which supports like a bunch of them. So uh, I think uh, out of the gate, we should be able to support support quite a few. Awesome, okay. thanks. So switch to green. Uh, I'm just gonna push. Okay, so, you know, if everything's working right. So what should happen here is I should see another build pop up. Um, as I said, this is, this is uh, doing a, uh, polling based approach so it you know might take like uh, hopefully like 15 seconds at the most for it to find a new build come on come on pop up with a new build let's see I didn't like screw up anything right get push oh wait yeah I did I branch your demo oh okay good Ooh. Man. All right. So that, you know, so now it picked up the new build. It's running, it's running the build. Uh, you know, hopefully this doesn't, I think the build, you know, will take a couple seconds or whatever. Um, but let me watch, let me sh show you this also. Rio PS, let's put a new line in there and build. So you can see kind of both of these, what's going on. So, okay. This guy, it, it finished building. So, it's this trusting Jackson one. So when it, it finishes building, it automatically creates a new revision. That's based off of the git commit. We'll probably make that prettier. But it creates a new revision, and then it automatically deploys the new version, and then promotes it, and so you can see it slowly rolling out the traffic. Okay, so like that whole workflow, like, you know, it, there's a new build, it automatically deploys it, and then slowly rolls over traffic. All of that behavior is all configurable. You don't have to do it like you can just have it like do a hard switch or you can actually make it so that when there's a new build, it just stages it and it doesn't put any traffic on it um, uh, or, or whatever. But like so the default behavior, if I don't change anything, is, is it does what it's doing now, which is, you know, the slow rollout of traffic. So you can see. So now as I change things, I just automatically just start getting this this new. Thing. So like right now, since it's about 50 50, you're seeing them, the blue and the green are both running here. And, uh, you know, so that, that's uh, uh, rolling out. Okay, so, so now that we also support auto scaling. Um, so let me, let me wait until this goes to 100%. Well, by the time I type the command, it'll probably go to 100%. Okay, so what we wanna do now is, I'm gonna use this command called hey, it's pretty cool. It's just a simple load gesture uh, written in Go. Um, and so the way the auto scaling works in Rio, and, and this is all based off of um, kind of the way Knative works, uh, what we're currently using is kind of a, I would say it's kind of a little bit of a hack of the Knative auto scaling, but we're moving more in line and ad adopting more wholesale, the, the kind of the Kubernetes or the Knative auto scaling. But basically it's concurrency based auto scaling. And so the idea is it's, it looks at what's the concurrency of your requests 
So, you know, you have to do a little bit of math from the metrics of looking at like what's the request per second plus the average response time. And then you can get an idea of what's the actual concurrency of the application. So by default, when we, uh, like when you just do like Rio run, um, you can see in here, we automatically, like by default, we always set things up as uh, concurrency as 10, which means my application can do 10 concurrent requests. The max scale is 10 and the min scale is one. You can actually go down to zero, which means it will completely shut off the service. Um, and we're doing a lot to optimize that to make it faster, but right now it's not super fast when you go from zero to one. Like in the current version, I mean, we're talking about like eight seconds, like that's pretty darn slow. Um, we have a new version that should be coming out like in another week. Uh, they'll be significantly faster, but the way we view scale to zero at the moment is that it's more of like a dev test optimization. Um, you know, it's an easy way to spin down resources when they're not used, but they're not, um, right now it's a little hard to get it like sub second uh, spin up time. Um, but anyways, so so let me show like kind of how this auto scaling stuff will work. So now um, I should have 100, yeah, 100% 100 of my traffic is now going to uh, going to the to the the view the the latest version or whatever. So I'm gonna run this command. Hey, and C is for concurrency. So the idea is if if I have if my max concurrency is 10 for of a container, if I want it to scale up to 100, then sorry, if I want it to scale up to 10, then it'd be concurrency times the replicas. So if I did a concurrent con, sorry concurrency of 100, then that should effectively scale up to 10. Um, you know, we'll do something like 70. And, and since this is all based off of monitoring data, it's a little, it's like the math is not perfect. So like we might get seven or eight, you know, so we'll, we'll see. Um, Z is just how long we're gonna run it. We're just gonna run that for an hour, just so it just keeps running while we're doing the demo. This tool only works with HTTP, so I'm just gonna do the HTTP URL. Um, so I have a special uh, URL, uh, path here called load in this demo application that makes the request slower because to actually get 10 concurrent requests and if your application responds in 10 milliseconds, it's actually hard to get 10 concurrent. Um, so this like this one URL will just slow down. Okay, so we should see um, once we start doing this, um, let me go to, okay, oh, well shoot, let me, Go back here. So you can already see, okay, it's already starting to scale up, okay? So as I've hit this, so now it's, you know, it's trying to do a scale of seven, four out of seven, these are what's ready. So, it, you know, it's bumping up. Um, oh, so now it went up to nine. I don't know. It will kind of float around. As I said, the, the math is a little fuzzy because it's off of the metric data. So, um, so it might float around like maybe like seven, eight, nine, something like that. Um, but you can see here, in my load balance. So now, you know, as, as I've added more load onto this thing, now I've got nine of these things running and load balancing. Um, but now it gets kind of like really neat when you combine auto scaling with the automatic deployments and the rollout and everything, because let's see, I've got, you know, I have some load running on this, so it, I need nine replicas running to handle the load. Um, if I go and let me change this now, and I'm gonna do, uh, we'll switch the color to red. Um, well, it's not good if you're red, green, colorblind. Let, we'll switch to, let's see, uh, what's another color I can do? Uh, am I already running blue? I'll switch it to blue. Go back to blue. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, Okay, bad commit message, and then uh, so we'll push this. So in theory, uh, if everything's working right, uh, push that. We should be getting uh, another build coming in. Again, we might have to wait like 15 seconds. Do, 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 do. Mm -mm -mm. The suspense. Aaron, while we're waiting for that, one of the questions that um, Marcy asked earlier was, could we set the scale minimum to one 
I've used Knative before and it didn't respect the minimum scale. I know you talked about scale to zero, but you were just saying there was a sort of challenges with Knative scaling to one. Maybe you can just chat about that while you're waiting. Yeah, I mean, scale, scale to one should work. I mean, it seems to be working fine for us. Um, I mean, the, the Knative is a very rapidly changing code base. I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, let me uh, let me show you so what's going on here. So now you can see what's happening is we're rolling out traffic. So like I said, we needed a total of about like nine replicas. So we did the build, it created a new version, the blue version, and now it's starting to roll out the traffic to it. So as it starts moving the traffic over to the new version, it's now starting to scale up the new version and then it will start scaling down the old version. Um, so we should start, you know, hopefully start seeing that behavior soon. Okay, yeah, man. There's a little bit of delay. In yeah, okay, so, so now we're starting to see that. Okay, that's scaling up to four. This one should start going down. So you can see, so, it, 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 you know, I don't know. I think this is cool. Um, so it's like, it's automatically deploying, it's maintaining, um, you know, automatically deploying, swinging the traffic over, maintaining like a same number of replicas based on whatever the load is. And then so all, when it's all said and done, you're gonna have the new version of the application running and you're gonna have zero of the old one running. And like, this is just, you know, it's all kind of just works. Um, just, I think it's pretty cool. Um, right, so, so that's kind of like if you, kind of tie together everything of like doing the git based deployments you know of actually building the docker images and then the automatic rollout plus the auto scaling um you know you you get all this kind of uh, nice behavior here um so i wanted to show you just quickly like if i start throwing some like some air traffic at this if um where was i running hey okay so here's hey here I have um, another URL, I believe it's called air. This one will just automatically respond with a 500. And so this one we're gonna hit, and we're, we're gonna put the concurrency much lower. Okay, so we're gonna just put it at two. So two concurrent requests, uh, should be hitting this, so I should be getting an air. So now when I run, let me go back here, get the, URL for Grafana. No, sorry, I wanted to show this one. Kiali. Um, let me just double check that. I'm getting, oh no, that's not the error. Oh, I think it's called fail. Let me just double check that. Yeah, those are, that's going to be 500 responses. Okay, yeah, okay, that makes more sense. So, okay, um, let's. Get, it's, it should be like maybe five to ten seconds before the all the med metrics is all scraped through Prometheus. So Prometheus has an interval of like 15 seconds or something. So, so we should start seeing that the uh, air counts and stuff will start going up here. Let's see. So all the traffic right now is that the, is my throwing all the yeah trust trusting Jackson. Let's see if things work right, then I should start seeing an air count. Yeah, okay. So I'm I'm starting to see a little bit of an airs. Oh, I think probably two is not enough because I'm doing a hundred concurrent. So let me do like twenty. So then it'll at least show like 10% or something. Okay. Yeah, so you can start seeing, so this is a, you know, this was like an old service I had. These are some old ones I, I was I was doing before um, I, I started demoing this. Um, so you can say this is like kind of like my, my mesh and these are all basic services, you know, like I just have ingress traffic, but if we had like kind of east-west you know, service to service traffic and stuff like that, it would all show in the graph and everything. But you can automatically start seeing the, um, like these are showing up in orange because, you know, there I think there's some level of errors going on in them. Um, but you can start seeing the traffic 
here is you know it's getting yeah as i was saying about 10 percent is 500s i think like on the overview so, so like if you're in in kiali it shows like oh you know hey there's something wrong with this application um because we're getting a certain amount of errors um again i was saying we're building our own ui for all this um uh so it will be uh you know we'll, we'll probably kind of tweak the way we show some of this stuff or whatever but but anyways but the, the whole point of this is like you know you can very easily identify like what's failing in your system it's just you know, we have all the data we can pull it all together we have the relationships and everything um okay um i think i probably will stop right there there's like a couple little other functionality that i, I want to show but i i think we should probably hold for some questions now or shannon or yeah, that's a good call. Um, I've got probably 30 or 40 outstanding. So why don't we go through a few of these? And um, I think we've covered most of what we'll cover in terms of demoing, right, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other functionality, there's a couple things like the router and and some other little things. But um, I may or may not show them depending on how much, you know, how long this goes. All right, great. Yeah. Well, so so Damien asked a couple questions. The first one was, how do you front Rio with AWS ALB? Is that difficult or trivial? Uh, yeah, that's trivial because uh, the um, so by default we're gonna set up the ingress traffic is going to be fronted with a Kubernetes service load balancer. So if you have a uh, if you're running EKS or you're using the AWS cloud provider in your Kubernetes distribution, then a service load balancer will automatically create an ELB. So all traffic will go through the ELB. So that's kind of just the default mode. It will just already that'll work. Um, I think it was asking about ALB, not ELB. Oh, sorry, ALB. So ALB yeah. is all is um, ALB. I believe is also uh, uh, feasible. That one, I'm trying to think, because this is kind of like all infinitely configurable. So you have to set up. Um, yeah, so like basically we can do ALB. What you're gonna want to do is you deploy Rio with the host ports option, and then you set up an ALB. Um, so again, like you know, since this is kind of alpha, like we don't have like proper documentation, all these different configuration things, and so we're kind of working on how to, you know, we'll document all these various ways. Because like as I said that in the beginning of the demo, like I'm not really wasn't gonna cover cover you know, kind of the depths of how to do all the administrative configuration, um, but it is possible. Um, uh, yeah, so you can run ALB in front of it. And so you would just basically set up one ALB that is then hit, then um, hitting the host ports of a couple of dedicated nodes. And there's a way to, with uh, labels on the nodes to select which nodes you want to run the ingress traffic coming through. Awesome. Um, now the other question Damien asked Let me, was. So I just want to I, I, I want to clarify one thing or whatever. Is like since we're using a service mesh, like the way it works is like traffic coming into the cluster first has to hit like an Envoy instance, and then once you're on in Envoy, then Envoy will route to wherever it needs to within the cluster. Um, so like if you put a load balancer in front of the in, in front of the the cluster. Um, you're always still gonna like the load balancer will then hit envoy which then routes it another like because that one knows about the service mesh so you still have to have kind of like kind of dedicated or not dedicated if you need to but like you can't have dedicated you have to like you know you have certain ingress points in your cluster where all traffic's going to go to like the point i'm trying to make is that like um if you have a pod it won't go directly from the load balancer to the pod there's like this intermediate step of entering the, the mesh and getting routed Awesome. Okay, so another question that Damien asked was, does how do you use environment variables with this? Uh, he's, he wasn't seeing it in the README and, and you know, <laughs> similar to any other 12-factor platform, is it a little bit different? Oh, no, I mean, it's just the same thing. I mean, so we have, um, uh, so, uh, like when you say Rio run, um, it's kind of the easiest to discover the API just by, so you can just do uh, ENV and then, um, we kind of have a uh, shoot, yeah, that isn't documented. We have a, cus, a like a custom syntax for ENV of like if you just wanted to like foo, um, like that would just be a simple thing of like foo bar, 
Um, but there's also a custom syntax, and I don't know it off the top of my head, of like you can pull things from like a config. So you can say like a config map, you can pull things from config or a secret or whatever. But um, if you're talking about like, you know, passwords and whatnot, you're, you're going to want to use um, secrets and config anyways. Uh, so you can easily bind in secrets and config. Um, so it's like, it's something like you just, uh, you would just do like dash dash config and you give the config name foo and then whatever the key, well, there, there's different approaches. If you want to bind the entire object to a directory like that, or you can bind a specific key, uh, to a file. Um, anyway, so you can do config secrets. It's all pretty simple. Um, I believe there's probably some examples of uh, at least configs in here. Um, let's go to stack. Yeah, this is, um, sorry, this syntax that I'm showing here is not actually a, a public feature yet in Rio. Um, this is something we, we're, uh, we're working on a, uh, a flow that's very similar to Docker Compose where you like oriented more towards development, a development flow where you can um, just easily define everything from one file. Um, and so like the configs here, where is it? Where's it mapped? I don't know where that's mapped. Oh, it's not used directly. But anyways, um, yeah, so we have support. So there's pretty much everything you can do with a regular Kubernetes pod you can do through Rio too. Um, we don't, we don't, the only functionality we don't expose of the pod is anything that would be a security concern because Rio is designed to to run and it's like, it's like a secure multi-tenant thing. So you can't do um, privileged containers or host, uh, host, uh, mounts or you know so, so certain certain different uh, things that cause security issues you can't do from from Rio. Okay, um, one other question. Uh, this one Andreas asked. He said, "Can can Rio run on a mixed Kubernetes cluster, um, AMD 64 and ARM 64 nodes?" I'm aware ARM Raspberry Pi isn't supported. So any could could we get it running on a mixed cluster? um yeah it should like in theory that can all work so like uh i'm not going to say it's probably gonna, it's probably not going to work at the moment just because we right now with rio we are doing arm builds and producing arm images but i'll tell you we've done zero testing of rio on arm i mean i don't even know if it will come up right now um, because it's all all the dependent things, things we depend on, like you know, uh, Knative and Istio and Cert Manager. All those things often don't work on ARM too. So we haven't done any testing yet on ARM. But in theory, it should it sh should all work, and we do want to support it because um, because of the stuff we're doing, like with K3S. Uh, you know, ARM is kind of an important platform. You know, like so all of our stuff that we're doing from Rancher now, we're trying to support ARM. So that's just more of the you know the earliness of this project that you know, we're kind of not mature enough to say that, you know, that use case is just going to work out of the box. But um, I'm open for, you know, if you want to try it, put in issues, we'll definitely fix it. But so it should yeah, all feasibly work. Help, help us on this one. I mean, we yeah, just yeah. Cause I know, like, really uh, use some community help on, on testing on different platforms. There's a lot that goes into this yeah. and, um, you know, we're always welcome for more contributors can, you know, whether it's just filing issues or it's actually, suggesting fixes in the code. It's an open source project, so dive in. Um, one of the questions Alexi asked was, well, actually, before we move on from that, there was a, a question Yusuf asked earlier about, uh, you know, kind of, could you run this on the edge? What are the minimum requirements? Do you want to just maybe address that? It's kind of in the yeah, same vein. So right now, um, so right now, you know, it's kind of, it's a little fatter than I would like it to be. And it actually has to do with all the monitoring stuff, um, Prometheus and, and whatnot. So um, we are we are heavily working on reducing that memory footprint. Like where Prometheus and stuff is is not actually required uh, in, a, in newer versions. The newer version we're working on Prometheus is not required for any core functionality. 
Um, so you can then move your monitoring stack uh, to a kind of different cluster or somewhere else um, if you don't have you know resources within the, the cluster. So this is something that we are also targeting for Edge as part of like our K3S and K3OS and like our Edge solution. Um, but right now it is too heavy. Like, as I said, it's like, it, it takes like three gigabytes of memory right now, if you wanted, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're saying is like the minimum amount of free space in your cluster, which is, which I think is just astronomical. Um, but, you know, we're, we're getting that down much, much lower. So, so not quite there yet, but it, it is, it is definitely an important use case. And so you will be able to okay. run on the edge. So is there, um, Alexi asked if there was open tracing integration and to what extent, or was that in your roadmap to, to do any tracing component? Right. So, I mean, so the open tracing stuff, um, in theory, like, so we haven't done a lot. Um, that's a pretty advanced thing that we're seeing from users of like pulling in like Zipkin or Jager or, or you know, those things. Um, so, in theory, we should be able to support those. So, it's, I, I would say, it's kind of like it's not high on our priorities right now of, you know, making distributed tracing just automatically work beautifully for everyone. Um, but since we are under the hood using Istio, we should be able to pull in those components. And so, I mean, I think that one, you know, if you're, if you're interested, like we have this, this, you know, thing called features in Rio where we can um, pull in different components. And so, you know, tracing would be a great feature that we could add in. I mean, so, if, but that one, you know, Again, I don't think it's it's, high, it's not high on our priority list of things we're working on. So if there's some community uh, help there, that would that would be great. But it should all work because we are leveraging Istio and stuff. And and the way that we're doing things, I mean, we really put a lot of effort into like we're trying to do like just like the way Rio works and the way we're using these components. Like nothing's like like it, it's all standard stuff like it should be very very compatible with the ecosystem um so okay um there were two questions eugene asked back when we were talking about um let's encrypt and and inserts and i i think we may have answered these but he said are wildcard domains required is it possible to support subfolders like mydomain.com slash app or and then is let's encrypt the only option for certs could custom certs be provided you know, for example, for services that don't face the outside world. Yeah, I don't think I quite understand the folder one, but I can comment on like, so yeah, you can basically, you can bring your own cert, you can re, you could change cert manager. Um, so, that, you know, these things, you know, it might be a little bumpy right now, but we'll, we'll definitely want to, you know, figure out. So, you know, we have like kind of the hooks and stuff where it's like, if you, because you can, like in these Rio features, you can basically just turn off the Let's Encrypt. And if we don't have Let's Encrypt, then you need to populate secrets with your own certificate. And um, so you can do things where it's like, well, don't deploy Let's, like turn off Let's Encrypt and then bring your own Cert Manager. And then Cert Manager can then manage it. And Cert Manager can do a lot of things of, um, uh, you know, different ways of getting certs or you can manually do it. So um, it should be very flexible. Because again, like like when we look at like a an enterprise context, you know, they're not gonna people aren't gonna really use Let's Encrypt. Um, so it it's important that <clears throat> you know, like for those type of users, that we can flip off that functionality and and use something which is gonna be like their in-house CA. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, another question, Andreas asks, are you supporting? Docker manifest right now, very useful for mixed architecture environments. He's using K3S. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, just to manifest lists, like you can do multi-arc images. Yeah, there's, um, that should all work. Um, but again, like I don't, I, I, I seriously doubt Rio is working, even though we're producing ARM builds, I, I, I doubt it's working on ARM. We just haven't had the time to fully test it out. Um, okay. But, you know, if people want to test it, I mean, that would help us immensely if people started, you know, pointing out, hey, this, you know, we'll fix it because we do want to support ARM. But again, just the earliness of this project. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alexi also said, last time I tried to install Rio over K3S, it was failing on Cert Manager, and I could get, uh, I couldn't get past that step without Cert Manager. I didn't, it, it couldn't get it to work at all. So I don't know if maybe that was an issue early on that 
you saw or have addressed? Well, we had uh, like uh, when we yeah that that might have been like like when we first launched Rio, um, like the fact that we issue production like Let's Encrypt will rate limit you. Um, and so when we first launched Rio, uh, we thought we had done all the things uh, to make it so that Let's Encrypt would not rate limit us. Like we were on the public suffix list and all this stuff. Um, but there was one little thing that we overlooked. And so when we first uh, released Rio, uh, the certificates were all failing um, because we were getting rate limited by Let's Encrypt. But that's been addressed now. Um, so I would say just try it again. I mean, we're we're you know constantly fixing things, and if if it's if it's still not working, please put it in issue. We'll we'll figure it out. I mean, K3s, you know, just because we also develop, you know, we also build K3s. We we obviously we run Rio on K3s all the time, so it should work. Okay. Um, Eugene got back and clarified his earlier question about the uh, subfolders. He said. Instead of having a wild card of my app dash branch dash name dash default dot domain dot com support my app dot domain dot com slash branch dash name. This is for environments where IT does not allow wild card DNS entries, but you'd want to create a staging environment for each Git branch. Does that make sense now? Yeah. And so um so I haven't covered this functionality of the router. I mean, so basically what you can do, oh I already put in some routes here. Like this is not automatic, but it is possible of like, you know, if you want, you can just set up domain, like you can create one static domain, because when you create a route, you give the you basically create a host name. Um, and then you can route different paths to different so like it basically sets up like an nginx i mean it's not running nginx but like you know logically the idea of what people would do of you know putting nginx in front and then routing all the traffic based on different paths um so you can set that all up in rio so you can have if you have 15 apps you can have 15 subfolders and each one of those goes to a different app and then that app is then based off of some git deployment um so that's not like going to be automatically done but like you can e very easily automate that um, so you can set things up that way. So, okay. Um, David asked a question. He said, you know, Red Hat will tell you that one of the reasons you need a full PaaS is it's source to image capabilities. Is there an equivalent in Rio? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, so that's kind of what we've been showing of, uh, you know, already oh. of, you know, this type of stuff is, you know, automatically. So all this like kind of source to image is that's, Knative build and Tekton and is doing that now. So it's that's a pretty kind of commoditized functionality now. And the and the nice thing, I didn't go really into detail of like the um when you do a build to let me show you up here. Um we're we're changing this, so it's gonna change because Tekton is different than Knative build. But the way it works right now is when you do a build, you can also put template here. Um, and then instead of using the default template, which we ship, which is does a basic Docker file based build, you can pull in a custom Knative build template and do whatever you want. It's, it's immensely flexible. Um, and so like you could do build packs if you wanted to, or something very custom to your organization. So you could do things where it's like this repo that you set up here let's say it doesn't even have a Docker file in it, it just has some Java source code because in your organization, all your Java projects are structured a certain way. So you just automatically build it based off of the build template. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility on how to do different type of builds. And so this, I think, you know, so it's like, uh, I know like the old versions of, of OpenShift, it was called like cartridges or something like that, or build packs. And so all that type of functionality is kind of all available. You can kind of roll your own thing or there's some things. So there's, you know, Pivotal and they have a project Riff and, you know, they're kind of heavily vested in build packs. And so they're working on the build pack V3 stuff that's all in CNCF. So all that stuff should work with Rio too. Awesome. Uh, another question uh, from Damien. He said, "What is a service load balance? Is what is the service load balancer based on? Nginx?" Oh no. So when I said service load balancer, I was just talking about the Kubernetes API object. Like it, you create a Kubernetes service, and it's of type service load balancer. 
And then how that service load balancer gets implemented is based on the configuration of your Kubernetes cluster. So if it was an Amazon, that would be an ELB. If it was a, you know, if it was Google, it would be their network load balancer. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's not an Nginx, that would be ingress, ingress approach. Um, there's actually, uh, it's possible to use an ingress controller in front of Rio too. Uh, again, it's like infinitely flexible. There's there's so many different ways um, to figure out how to route the traffic in that it just ends up being like this kind of, um, everyone's got a different way to do it, I guess. Awesome, okay. But, but yeah, uh, my the answer progress. was it just depends. <laughs> Okay. We're making good progress, though. There are lots more questions coming in now. Um, all right. So uh, going back to uh, some earlier questions, this one was from Jan, uh, Jan, I'm guessing, and he said, will you include Loki to view the logs in Grafana in the future as well? Uh, um, yeah, we haven't, and that's kind of like on the roadmap of a, some type of log aggregation solution. Um, so I don't, I don't know the answer there yet, but it's like, it's on the roadmap of like that. We, we realize that's a gap. Um, like for example, like K native, I think pulls in like elastic search and, and stuff. And we don't want to do that. It's so heavyweight. Um, so we're trying to figure out, um, a simple way to do logs. Um, so that one, that's a big, uh, to be determined. I don't know. I don't know exactly what we're, um, we're going to do. Another question. Do you happen to know if there's any WAF, uh, Web Application Firewall automation on Istio Gateway, or would you suggest that it may be reasonable to keep Nginx ingress in front of Istio Gateway, if this makes sense at all? Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for like that WAF, that type of, um, uh, that type of functionality, you can put that in front. I mean, obviously you have a certain amount of latency, but I mean, you're kind of already decided you want that by just, you know, it has to inspect the traffic. So as I was saying before, like you, you can, you can put uh, an, in, you can put a, an ingress controller in front of Rio. Um, it just requires more configuration. And then that ingress controller can be Nginx. And then the Nginx controller is like very flexible. And I don't know, I'm not super familiar with what the plug on, plugins are for, for that type of stuff, but but I, I believe it. I believe it's there. But I'm not aware of like that functionality, just like open source already in Envoy, for example. Um, Shrikant asks, can we use Rio with a YAML file parameter? What is the minimum parameters required in YAML to quick start? Well, like on my screen here, um, yeah. So like basically, well, here I'll show you. Rio run, let's just say, so here's the simplest thing, like Nginx. So if I say Rio edit, by default, we add in a bunch of extra parameters that aren't needed. So basically the smallest one is going to be basically um, that, and then you have to put I'm doing an edit, so this, uh, but it would, or actually here, I'll do it this way. Let me just export it, because it'll give me a full resource. So um, the smallest would basically look like that. Um, which is basically the image and the port mapping. If you don't put any ports, then it will not be exposed out to the world. Um, yeah, so if you, so you do have to put a port mapping. So that's basically the smallest, simplest service that you can do. Um, and yeah, and then this is just this is just a standard Kubernetes. So you can just pipe this to kubectl, uh, you know, apply, apply or whatever, and it'll it'll create it. Um. Okay, another question. This is maybe a little bit longer one. Alexi asked, he said, do you have any recommended approach for microservice architecture? You know, for example, we have 180 services all developed and deployed by different dev groups, but we need to keep track of versioning and compatibility of these services, i.e. service A version 1.01 can only work with 
service B versions 2.5.9 to 2.7.5, etc. Want to take a hack at that? Anything you can you know of that would help with that microservice architecture and and kind of linking of services based on version? Hmm. No, I mean, yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I don't know, like something kind of like off the shelf or whatever could it manage all the version dependencies and whatnot. I mean, with something like Rio, you can, because you can route all the traffic and you can do kind of external services and things work between namespaces and whatnot. Um, you can set up because you can create like virtual names, which then alias or or load balance to other services um you could set up a whole taxonomy um of names and 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 whatnot but I, I, you know that's you're still kind of all rolling that all yourself so no i don't really know like some kind of magical way to kind of manage all that you know, microservice framework or something like that maybe out there no 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 kind of a, a, another question from alexi on on similar to i said how would you pass a huge number of parameters and slash environments to Rio run? And how we could set it through values.yaml? Is there some similar way to manage parameters and configs? Or would you recommend any other external configuration management that integrates well with Rio components? Um, yeah, so I mean, at that point, I would just say, well, just deal with the YAML under the hood. I mean, so, so, you know, like there's no reason. So Rio run is, is really like, the Rio CLI is to really help you to interact uh, with, like, it's a an iterative, interactive flow to to work with Rio. But if you're doing like automation and whatnot, you're uh, gonna want to just be dealing with the YAML uh, files and then just uh, deploying things through. Uh, like a CI, you know, some CI/CD pipeline or whatever that you set up. So it's like, you know, if you were to take um, the, you can take the Rio configuration, like a Rio YAML, and then combine that with customize, and then you would get, you know, a decent solution of just deploying, deploying stuff. Um, so you know, we are, we are doing more solutions. Like we have more features coming in Rio that is more about making the the um both the developer experience better of like actually developing an application and then um and then pipeline which is more complicated stuff uh to do uh you know bigger bigger things because like right now we're just doing source to image like that's that's a very simple flow but a pipeline is is where you you know you're going to be building your application deploying it somewhere running some tests you know maybe across multiple clusters like you know and like our pipeline flows we do is like we simultaneously deploy our application on three clusters that are you know arm v7 arm 64 and, and intel we run all of our tests and then when we're done we produce manifest you know so the complicated pipelines you know we're doing all that functionality in rio but anyway so um so yeah i think that was kind of uh long-winded there that's <laughs> okay. Um, all right, still still a handful of questions. Let's keep going. Um, Guy Gayatri Gayatri Gayatri. I think I got it. Um, how do you handle multi-tenancy? How do you manage multiple users deploying apps on a shared cluster? There's also a question of how does a single user manage apps on multiple clusters? So do you want to talk about both directions? One cluster, right, yeah. Yeah, users, so, one user, separate clusters. Right. Yeah. So multiple we'll start with multiple users on the same cluster so the idea of rio is that like i was saying um the types like a rio service um you can't the user's not allowed to do anything that would that would you know impact security so like by default they're already secure um you, there's you know there's other concerns with container containers of just whether or not you trust um, container technology for hard multi-tenancy. So I'm gonna kind of leave that to the side because you know there are things you can use CAD containers to, to give you stronger isolation or or maybe you trust SE Linux or you know so there's different things that, so I'm not gonna kind of talk to the multi-tenancy of whether or not you trust containers. But the idea of, of, of Rio is that we're deploying containers in a secure fashion already given the underlying technology is secure then, then um, the containers are secure also. Um, the model is just basically uh, you set up 
a namespace and you put the RBAC privileges in there so that the users can create the Rio objects. And so the idea with Rio is if I want to set up a proper secure multi-tenant cluster uh, with Rio, I would give people right access to just the Rio objects, not pods or deployments or like they couldn't modify those things. Um, because if you just go through the Rio interface, uh, you can give them read access to things, but just not write. If you just go through the Rio interface, then we, we do all these things to properly lock it down. Um, <coughs> so I would feel, um, you know, I, that's like one of the use cases we see um, is that people within an organization would set up a large multi-tenant cluster and share it among multiple development groups for like a dev environment and, and even production too. Um, so it's all des kind of designed for that, like it should be. But like right now we don't have like the canned RBAC rules and stuff. Like, so we're still working on those of like, here's like a out of the box role that's gonna, uh, you know, make it so it's secure. Uh, so we're still working on those. Um, but that's, you know, that's all kind of in the design, it should work. Okay, so that's for multi, you know, multiple users on the same cluster, then cross cluster. So cross cluster, um, we have every intention of making Rio work across clusters. So your applications um, will confederate across multiple uh, clusters. And that one, I just kind of have to just say, yes, we're working on that. Like, that's very important because the whole idea is that, um, like, I can't give a lot of like the, kind of the technical details quite yet of like what, how we're planning on doing this. But the whole idea with Rio is we want to abstract users from the underlying infrastructure. And, and in my view, um, people are treating clusters kind of like pets these days. And they're very attached to their clusters and the clusters have stayed. And, and, and so it's like, we want to abstract people from the clusters, what cluster they're running on. It's much easier if all the cluster management and the size of the clusters and how you scale them is all independent of the application workload. So you can kind of separate application and, and the, uh, um, under, and the, uh, uh, you know the team running the infrastructure. So yes, we are we are we are. It's a very important use case for us. But um, how we're doing it, we'll, uh, it's, we'll kind of announce later, later, I guess. Thanks, Ben. And then uh, another question. Eugene had said um, he was asking. He said it would be really amazing to see Metal LB integrated or something similar to Elm, Metal LB. Um, become part of Rio. Do you know? If, I don't know if you thought about that or if that's something. You well, I mean, so, yeah, Metal LB is is just implements the service load balancer interface, so it will work already. So if your cluster already has Metal LB, when you deploy Rio, it creates a service, so we'll be using Metal LB for the ingress. Um, so again, it's going to go through Metal LB, you know, which is just basically like a VRP, you know, kind of load balancer. So it's going to go through Metal 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 LB to. Uh, um, uh, Meta LB to Envoy, and then from Envoy gets routed to where it needs to go. Um, awesome. Yeah, so it should, it's um, just, honestly, it should just work today already. Another question, what, what's captured as part of a revision, and is it back by a custom resource in Kubernetes? Ask that again? I don't think I got the first. What, what's captured as part of a revision? And is it backed by a custom resource in Kubernetes? Right. So, okay. So this is kind of like, I think one of the places where we differ from kind of uh, approach between Knative serving and what we're doing is a revision is um, actually, basically all a revision is, is it's just another service with a, uh, a field that says revision. So it's like, let me show you here on the, on the, um, uh, screen, let's see, uh, Rio revision. So if I say Rio export, um, so I got this revision here. So let's call that foo. And then um, if I take another vision of the same thing. Bar, diff foo bar. So you see the um, 
the difference between uh, a revision is largely the field called I mean so all a revision is is it's another service object sorry let me just actually just edit this so you can see so when you create a revision you just create a new service object the, like the full configuration of that service and you basically um, just specify no sorry that's for the build revision um, sorry it's the field is called version sorry um, so you have two separate services, but we correlate them together. If the, if every if a service has the same app field, then we say okay, those two services are related and they're different versions. And then the version field down here just basically gives you know names the version, and the combination of app plus app plus version is what we call a revision, I guess. Um, but so the thing is, is revisions for the most part is managed by you, and this is where like I kind of stylistically like kind of differ with what Knative is doing. Like Knative serving today, as you change the object, they create basically revisions for you automatically by the controller. Like to me, I want to manage uh, the revisions basically like through Git and and like to me the, the cluster is not, uh, does not hold important state uh, so like having the revision history as something that's generated in the cluster and maintained in the cluster is, is not like something like I don't, I'm not particularly fond of that approach. It's like if I'm going to be creating multiple revisions of something, then I really want to manage that myself through Git and be able to do the deployments and everything. So so there's really not a lot of magic to the way revisions work is it's like it's you're you're kind of managing it yourself. And it's and what we do is as part of the the Git based stuff is um you know basically we take an existing service and when the git changes then you know basically we create a brand new service like this which is you know this repo but on this specific revision and then we automatically tag it with a version and we just create services for the automated workflows awesome um another question that kind of gets back to the helm charts question we talked about earlier christian said can i define rio services in helm charts yeah. So I mean, so again, it's just it's just a Kubernetes resource. So something like this or whatever, you can just you know, put it in there. Um, the the question is like, you know, it's like when you start getting into let me do like Canary deployments and AB and stuff like that. You know, how do you manage that through if your flow is is Helm charts? Like that's where things get kind of like complicated and hard. But if you just want to deploy Rio services and um, you know, it's like you have a service and then you just update the service or whatever. Like it, it just works fine through Helm. Or, I mean, you can still do the Canary stuff and whatnot. whatnot. It's just, you have to just kind of figure out how you want to manage it through Helm through like different like values, YAML and stuff like that. So like each time you deploy the app, you can give it a different revision or version number or something. Um, okay, another question. Uh, this was from Shrikant. He said, uh, can I confirm if service mesh? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, there's very, there's very likely that we're going to come up with a, uh, you know, some type of packaging uh, flow, because I mean, there's, so there's, there's different. It all depends on how your organization works and how your workflow works. And it's like some people want this automated, like from source, go through a pipeline, deploy. So like the CD flow. Um, so in a CD flow, like from source to deployment, a Helm chart is like a weird intermediate artifact that doesn't make a lot of sense, to be honest. But if you're, but there's other flows where it's kind of like I build my application and it produces an artifact, then somebody picks up that artifact and then deploys it in another environment. Maybe that step is automated, but like they use the Helm chart as this intermediate step. Um, and so, uh, in those type of workflows, like you know, then it kind of makes sense where you you're basically building packages, or or if you're someone where like you build your application once and you're delivering it to multiple, you know, like you're a platform team or something like that, you you deliver and it has to be installed multiple times or or whatever. So anyway, so like the the creating a package in a bundle. So there's a very good chance we're gonna have a flow within Rio that that produces like a Helm chart or or you know, something equivalent, um, you know, probably Helm Charter, just, you know, wherever Helm V3 is going and stuff. Okay. Um, the next question was from Trecon. He said, can I confirm if service mesh could support encryption in transit with short-lived auto-cycling of certificates? 
Yeah, I mean, you're, you're saying you're getting into the MTLS stuff. So like right now we don't have like MTLS turned on. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a can of worms uh, with STO when you start troubleshooting things and stuff. But so that is kind of the on the roadmap of the start doing the turning on some of the security functionality in STO um, like MTLS. And so the MTLS stuff is like Citadel is automatically issue or is it Citadel? And basically you're automatically issuing certificates and rotating them and you have a spiffy identi identifier and all the traffic is then um, identified by, you know, whoever this, the source and, and you can do our back and permissions and policies and all that stuff. Um, so the, that capability is all there, um, and we'll be bringing that in in kind of like a later, later phase. But I mean, not not super far off. Okay, well, coming down the home stretch. There's five or six more questions. Um, uh, this question was: Would Cert management support Vault? Uh, uh, I think so. That that one, um, yeah, I imagine. Uh, I haven't like tried it myself or specifically seen the configuration, but I'm pretty sure like cert manager can talk to vault as a ca but i could be completely wrong but um there's so many different ways to get a certificate in there that you're going to be able to find some approach because at the end of the day what rio needs for the certificates is basically create a a, a secret a tls secret in kubernetes of a certain name so there's like you know infinite ways to do that um, so you should be able to integrate it, but I imagine Cert Manager already has something. Okay. Another question from David uh, was, well, it's not really a question, he said, suggestion, when multiple options exist, for example, multiple service meshes, all based on Envoy, go with the CNCF project option. So I take this as a more of a, um, I know you look, spent a lot of time kind of debating publicly on Twitter between Istio and Linkerd, um, and obviously this was all before the SMI yeah. Yeah. to exist, but um, you eventually decided to go with Istio and, and the team did as at least the first implementation of service mesh in Rio. And um, maybe you can just talk about why and, and why, you know, what, what you liked yeah. about your team, what you liked about Istio and what made you drive that decision. Yeah, so, um, so Rio, so as I said, like we have every intention in the future to support more service mesh and we're, we're very cautious about what the integration point, what, what are the touch points between Rio and the service mesh and how we're doing that. Um, so like I'm actually a huge fan of Linkerd. Um, I think it's an incredibly good service mesh. Um, you know, if, if you're looking to just pick up a service mesh and just use it directly yourself, uh, Linkerd is great. Um, the In terms of the type of functionality that we wanted to do, um, Istio, it's like Istio is like, you know, the pro of like the, the advantage of Istio is it does basically everything. The disadvantage of Istio is, is it's extremely complicated um, and it's kind of hard to manage. So by Rio managing Istio for you, we take on all that burden ourselves of managing Istio so, so you don't have to know about it. So that makes it from a user significantly easier because um, you're just not having to interact with it because it's, it's not like it's a, terrible flaky thing. It's it's if you're trying to deploy it and configure it yourself and manage the configuration of Istio, it's very hard um, because if you just screw up some parameter, the whole thing kind of stops working. Or not the whole thing, but like you'll just suddenly get like unavailable services and it's very hard to troubleshoot. But since we're doing it through a controller and it's automated and it's a very specific pattern, um, then it's, it's much more reliable. So, um, you know, so the main reason that we're going with Istio right now is just the, the the amount of functionality it has already available to us. There's really nothing that compares to it. Um, but as the other service meshes, you know, like Linkerd, as they continue to add more functionality, we very much want to support them. Um, Istio is very heavyweight. You know, it's like Mixer is really a big uh, kind of problem. Um, that's when I was talking about like trying to make uh, Rio lighter weight using less memory more feasible for the edge a lot of that is actually getting rid of mixer getting rid of the whole um monitoring approach of how istio is working um because it, it just uh, there's a lot of issues there um but anyway so 
kind of pros and cons. So uh, we uh, we were uh, kind of we were involved in the, the announcement of SMI, which is Service Mesh Interface. Uh, so we really hope that project uh, continues forward and becomes a feasible option, so that we can actually just program Rio to SMI, and then you, you can use whatever Service Mesh is available to you. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, there was one question from Eugene. He said, would Rancher entertain the idea of having Rio support Docker Swarm, or is it only going to support Kubernetes? Yeah, it's just Kubernetes. I mean, we're we're pretty, yeah. Um, you know, kind of the difference there is, is you know, uh, Swarm is an implementation of a, you know, a certain basically container use case, whereas Kubernetes is a full-on, like, um, architecture and framework to build things. So the controller pattern and all that stuff. So it's like at this point, it's just not not really feasible. We're too heavily invested in kind of Kubernetes and the whole ecosystem. Um, another question was uh, uh, Damien asked. He said, "I would love to see an example of using a build pack." We were talking about this about 20 minutes ago. And you know, if you, is there an example of a build pack that you could show or point to, or maybe talk about later, or post to Twitter or something, maybe later? Yeah, I mean, we could probably put together like a blog for it or something. I don't have uh, an example on hand, um, but yeah, I mean, that would be like a great thing to to blog and show how to use a, a build pack. Um, you know, so like in terms of like if you look at Rio, like like the, um, you know, we're still, you know, there's still a good amount of documentation and things that you know we're 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 working on. It's like the the docs today are mostly it's pretty much just all the 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 uh, readme it shows all the different use cases um, but we're still working on kind of you know putting more info you know more content basically out there of how to use rio and there's really i mean it's quite uh there's, there's really quite a bit of functionality like baked into it so we have a lot to document and stuff okay another question uh ek asked if every exposed service is a direct external IP or proxy through the Istio ingress? Yeah, so it's all going through the Istio gateway, which is Envoy. And then, you know, based on your Kubernetes architecture, that you're going to have one more layer in front of Envoy, most likely, um, which will be like a layer seven or probably a layer four load balancer. Um, and so it's everything is um, just, I mean, it's, it's like, Rio right now for ingress is heavily, heavily oriented. I mean, basically we only have support for HTTP based stuff for the ingress. So it's all layer seven based. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about IPs. Um, it's all agnostic to that. It, it just routes all based off of the host header. Um, so yeah, so you, everything is just routing through, you know, whatever, whatever layer seven approach, you know, you're getting traffic to the, to the cluster. And then Envoy takes it over from there. All right, last one, then we wrap it up. Uh, and this is an easy one. Um, do you, uh, Damien just asked, do you have a link to the GitHub repo code where the ELB automatically gets created? Um, cannot find, seem to find it. So does that make sense? Oh, well, okay, so we don't, so what happens is when we install Rio, um, let me see if I can, if it can okay, Rio install YAML. Uh, uh, oh shoot! Was that a different step? Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Uh, I'll do it this way. Rio system get service. Um. It is going to be this one, yeah. So basically, we create this Istio gate, like in the Rio, in the Rio system namespace, we create this service Istio gateway v0. This is the load balancer. So basically, this is just a. Um, this is just a Kubernetes service, and so. You know, basically, we just create this spec here, which says, okay, well, we want these ports to go to here to the selector, or whatever. So we create this service, and then the implement, like the 
cluster itself implements this. And then this is depends on the configuration of the cluster. So like the code that actually spins up the ELB, for example, that's going to be in Kubernetes. And, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's going to, in the actual Kubernetes, Kubernetes repo. Um, that stuff is all in the cloud provider. Um, something here. Package, cloud provider, providers. Oh, did AWS get moved down already? I don't know. Um, they were in the wrong directory. But anyways, so the, um, yeah, so it's actually in, in here. Now I'm curious about this. <laughs> Oh, no. oh, oh, they moved this all to legacy cloud. Oh, cool. I'm really excited to see cloud providers get moved out. Um, yeah, this is, no, this is not master, but I go back to an older release. The AWS code is still, I believe, yeah, in like 114, it's still in, 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 in the core. But anyways. All right. All right, thanks, Darren. I think that covers all of the demoing, and uh, we're now two hours in. So I'm going to wrap us up. Um, yeah. I think we we talked through all of this already, but if you need information on how to install Rio, just go to the GitHub uh, page, and you'll find it there. You basically, you just need 1.13 or newer Kubernetes cluster that you can boot from, uh, boot up Rio on. Uh, if you haven't found it yet, that's where you can find the Rio uh, GitHub project. Please uh, throw us a star, um, give us, uh, you know, file an issue, get involved, yeah, offer to help. We really, uh, all the help we can get is appreciated. So you are welcome, you are welcome, you are welcome. Um, if you just want to get started with Rancher, we talked a little bit at the beginning, you know, you can find our quick start guides uh, on the Rancher Docs page or on just go to the rancher.com page, you'll find it there. And with that, I want to thank Darren for spending so much time on the demo and showing so many different things. Thank you all for the fantastic questions. Darren, I don't think your demo blew up at all today, so you get lunch now that we're done. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. uh, everyone, uh, I don't know if we'll have another online meetup in July, but uh, I'm sure we'll have one soon, if, if not in July, then in August. So have a wonderful uh, summer, and we'll talk to you guys all soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Sure.